Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ian Blackshire. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Layer 47 uh, Tin Tree webinar this afternoon. Um, this is a, a series of webinars we uh, run every two weeks um, on a Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock. So the um, intention this afternoon is to introduce you to the Tin Tree technology, uh, which is specific storage solution for virtual machines. Um, we intend to, uh, the webinar will last for around about an hour. Um, we'll stop about 10 to uh, for qu any questions. Um, and so uh, just general housekeeping, your, mic, your phones are on mute. So if you have any questions, uh, could you please um, issue them via the chat, chat option uh, at the end of the webinar. I'm joined today uh, by Gavin Layfield, who's the UK Regional Manager for Tintree. Uh, my role at um, Layer 47 is, is that I'm one of the directors uh, responsible for business development. So if we... Um, Pretty simple agenda. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction to Layer 47 and the types of technology that we deal with, and then I'm going to hand over to Gavin, who's going to give you uh, a brief summary overview of Tintree, and then um, he's going to do a technical demonstration, and then then we'll um, stop for any questions, and then. Uh, we'll talk about um, possible next step, which uh, could be that um, you take the Tintree solution on, on a uh, free trial. So just let me um, talk about um, Layer 47 uh, and the types of work that we do. So we're at... Um, we're an IT infrastructure company. We um, we provide different types of technology to solve uh, complex IT issues. We're part of a bigger group uh, called JetNexus, um, and we've um, been in the IT business for more than 10 years. And the types of technology focus that we have. Um, we've, we're heavily involved in WAN optimization, so we're a riverbed partner and have been for a good many years. Uh, we also um, have a strong focus on load balance, balancing, again through riverbed and the Jet Nexus technology. And some areas that we're also getting into is obviously is data center virtualization and optimization, and I'll talk about that. And obviously storage. So um, we have an extensive range of uh, vendor relationships, of which Tintree is one. Uh, but we also have relationships with most of the uh, key players in, in the storage market. So during the time that we've been in business, we've, um, we've got clients that are in public sector. Uh, we have a good many uh, hosting companies. So from a uh, load balancing perspective, and then we also have a number of, of e um, prestigious e-commerce clients that we provide a suite of technology for. One of the things that um, we are focused on is that we, we're, we're always on the lookout for an in innovative technology, and, and Tintree you could uh, categorize in, in, that, in that way. Um, and the focus of this is that we're, we're constantly trying to improve performance, but also drive, help our clients drive down their costs. So there's a number of different areas that we're focusing on at the moment. Uh, there's you know, some really interesting uh, technology from a, a data center optimization perspective on obviously VDI and, um, and the SSD storage arena, of which obviously Tintree is one of the major players. So as I mentioned, the, uh, these webinars uh, we run every uh, two weeks. Uh, the next one of, of them is going to be based on Next.io, which is a really, really interesting technology 
that um, helps you drive down your data center costs, so it eliminates um, server cards and uh, tabling, and some of the clients that we're dealing with are, have reduced their ongoing operational expenditure on their data centers by something like 40 to 60 uh, percent. We're then going to be doing a, um, a NetApp uh, storage uh, webinar in, in December, and then early next year we've got a number of different uh, formats that we're going to be introducing. So um, in terms of uh, just very briefly some of the clients that we, we have, um, there's some sort of household names there and a variety. Some of these clients are um, WAN optimization, some of them are uh, load balancing and some of them are storage and some of them have got all three of those, those um, IT areas that we're dealing with. So that, that's uh, as much as I wanted to say about uh, layer 47, I'm now going to hand over to Gavin who's going to give you an overview of Kingtree. Okay, thanks very much Ian. Um, good afternoon gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to show you something quite special today. Uh, obviously I'm biased, uh, I work for Kingtree, but um, you don't have to take my word for it, I'm going to show you towards the end of the session. So uh, let me just show my screen, bring up my slide deck. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the history of Tintree, who we are, um, some, some basic product positioning so that you can understand where we fit in the storage marketplace. Obviously quite a crowded landscape. Uh, I want to take you through um, some of the features of the product um, and then I'm going to take you through a demo towards the end. So as the Ian said at the top of the, the, top of the presentation, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to help answer those. Uh, use the chat panel on the right hand side of the little app that you've got there to go to webinar. Uh, and we'll, we'll pick those up towards the end of the session and, and we'll come back to them. So my name is Gavin Layfield. I look after the channel uh, and the region here for the, for the UK and Ireland at Sintry. Uh, I have a background uh, both in the reseller level but also at distribution. Um, and I was at once upon a time uh, an engineer. So I was a Cisco qualified uh, networking engineer and then I moved into the storage marketplace. Uh, for a short time in engineering and then moved to the dark side of, of, of sales in a more commercial role. Uh, but I do have a fairly intimate understanding of, of all things storage and networking. Uh, and I've worked with and sold the vast majority of technologies out there on the marketplace today. So, uh, you know, EMC, NetApp, IBM, HP, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and certainly Tintree, I came across Tintree after a, a, an introduction uh, by an ex-colleague um, and I hammered on their door for a job the next day. Um, it, it was probably the most exciting storage platform to come out of Silicon Valley in the last 15 years. So uh, hopefully you'll, you'll see why. So who is Tintree? Uh, Tintree were founded in 2008 uh, by a guy called Dr. Kieran Harkey. And Kieran was the Enterprise Vice President of, of Engineering uh, at VMware from 99 through 2006. So he and his team developed uh, all of the products that you all know and love from, from VMware, including Lab Manager, vSphere, VMView, uh, the full suite. Uh, and Kieran uh, left shortly after the acquisition by EMC. He had this concept for a storage appliance which would be purpose-built from the ground up for a hypervisor and virtual machine environments. Uh, and that was something that it just simply was not possible to integrate into EMC's uh, existing product line at the time. And actually they were uh, quite some way down the road to developing the current VNX platform at the time that the acquisition went through. Uh, so all of their engineering resource and development resources was well and truly consumed at that point. So the idea was that um, you know, Kira would be better off leaving EMC to start this project, uh, which he did. He took a number of people from his team with him. Um, we've also got people from Google, from Sun, uh, from NetApp, Data Domain, um, many of the leading vendors out there in the marketplace. One of the notable key members of our core design team and, and also a member of the board actually is, is Dr. Ed Lee. Ed was one of the original members of the Berkeley RAID team. He actually wrote the first ever uh, RAID SCSI driver. Uh, so that's Ed Lee's uh, claim to 
same kind of help create RAID technology. So I like to refer to this product as, as a culmination, uh, a storage product designed expressly for virtualization as a collaboration between the guy that created and helped create VMware's product line uh, alongside uh, Ed Lee who created RAID technology. So a ringing endorsement there for, for our product. Our, our pedigree is something we're very proud of. Uh, we are obviously uh, venture capital based. We're, we're based out of uh, California. Um, and uh, uh, NEA and Lightspeed Venture Partners are the two key VCs behind our business. They are the two largest VCs over in the valley along with Sequoia who also work with us in, in some capacity. So, uh, you know, the two, two uh, venture capitalists mentioned there uh, were behind technologies like Riverbed, uh, like Data Domain, uh, Isilon, uh, and certainly they're um, very well respected. So we just had a, a, a recent round of funding by uh, for which we were seven times oversubscribed, uh, which is something that we're very um, we're very proud of. Also, so there's a lot of goodwill out there for our technology and our product and our platform. Uh, we've been shipping products since 2010. We now have over 200 customers globally. Uh, many many products deployed in the field, and I can show you some of the customers that we're working with. Um, and obviously, you can see that we are a, a VMware elite technology partner, as you as you can probably appreciate given. Uh, background and heritage. So this slide might leave a few of you cold. Uh, unless you've been asleep for the last seven or eight years or so, you'll, you'll already know this. So there are now more virtual machines deployed than physical uh, shock horror. Um, you know, since 2009, there was a bit of an inflection point where the, the VMs deployed um, exceeded the number of physical VMs in the marketplace. But it says that only 50% on average are virtualized. Um, by that we mean 50% of the server estate or the application estate gets virtualized. So adoption really often slowed down by either complexity, performance, or cost. Um, also, you know, a number of applications which which traditionally people will leave uh, physical, uh, either through uh, fear of failure uh, or or through you know uh, best practice recommendations by the vendor, uh, or just through. Um, so things like Exchange, like SQL, like Oracle, like SAP, uh, SharePoint, these tend to be applications that are more challenging to virtualize. So Sintry really designed to address those requirements in the marketplace. We're actually very good at virtualizing highly transactional environments. Uh, so as you'll see as we move through the presentation, we give you the option to virtualize those applications which previously have been either too challenging or too costly to do on traditional storage architectures. This is quite a technical slide, um, designed really, uh, the takeaway for this slide really is I want you to be confused by it. If you're not confused by it, congratulations, you understand storage quite well. Um, this, is, this is EMC's reference model for 500 seat VDI deployments. Um, and it's really designed to highlight, it's placed in my presentation, it's designed to highlight the complexities of traditional storage architecture. Because uh, the configuration required to build this out is actually you know, quite long-winded. Um, and that's not unique to EMC. You know, they make good technology, um, as do NetApp, IBM, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're very, very, um, they're very well-made technologies, and they have a lot to offer. However, um, they come from an era whereby you know, storage subsystem constructs were built using RAID, uh, and then LUNs on top of those RAID groups, and then volumes, perhaps, and file systems again on top of that before being presented up to up to the server layer. Uh, and what virtualization has done is, is, is simplified uh, the server layer. Uh, it, it's consolidated the hardware down into uh, a much smaller footprint. Uh, but as the server layer has shrunk, uh, VMware or virtualization particularly has given storage admin uh, a lot more to think about. So storage has tended to sprawl where servers have shrunk in the market. Certainly, provisioning performance to any given application or group of users within the environment based on traditional storage through a hypervisor is quite a challenge and actually uh, keeps quite a lot of people awake at night. So, uh, this slide really just intended to highlight that, that you know, trying to configure storage to give a deterministic level of performance to a particular set of users or to a specific application is actually quite challenging. People will either avoid virtualizing those challenging applications with mission-critical front of 
house applications perhaps to drive revenue streams for the business, and they'll leave them physical, or you know, they make the compromise. If they virtualize them, they will have a dedicated LUN on a dedicated part of the storage presented up to the, the application to ensure performance delivery, which kind of makes a mockery of virtualization in the first place. It's, 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 um, it's the exact opposite, in fact, to, uh, to consolidating at the storage layer. So I'm, I'm really just taking you through what I perceive to be the problem and what, uh, what Kieran felt was the issue in the marketplace and the reason for developing the technology. Uh, and it really is it's about the flexibility and the fluidity uh, of VMware not playing well with the storage underneath. So storage, traditional storage, does not play nicely with virtualized environments. Uh, it's the problem that most people largely ignore because, first of all, they're, they're very used to using storage in this way. Um, it's, it's been this way for 15 years plus. Uh, and secondly, they don't realize there's a better way to do it, a different way to do it. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give you that option today after the presentation. So uh, this slide here, is, is highlighting the, the, the need for multiple data stores, multiple tiers of performance within the storage. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, storage really carved out to provision relative performance for particular applications. And so typically they'll get a gold, silver, bronze, platinum type approach to, to data tiering within a storage environment, different types of disk, different spindle speeds, uh, different cache allocation. Um, and, uh, and you end up with many, many data stores, often 500 gig or, or to, you know, somewhere between 502 terabytes per LUN formatted with VMFS. Uh, and, and what happens very quickly is, is even in modest environments, you end up with many, many objects uh, to manage within the storage itself. Uh, and as you can see here in this slide, uh, Tintry is represented by a large footprint 13 and a half terabyte NFS mounted data store. So slightly different in the use of NFS, opposed to iSCSI or, or fiber channel, we are uh, a NAS essentially, uh, presented over 10 gig or 1 gig Ethernet, uh, up to vSphere and to ESX hosts over NFS. Uh, that in itself simplifies the deployment uh, and the management of the platform. We have this large volume of, of shared capacity, uh, but we have no concept of subdividing that 13 and a half terabytes or tiering it in any way. Um, we do have RAID for data protection, but we don't allow you access to that RAID configuration. So you're not carving out RAID groups, you're not building spindle groups, you're not, you're not providing LUNs uh, and mapping them to hosts. It's, uh, it's a much, much simpler environment, and we rely on the intelligence of the platform and our integration to VMware to make sure that we give deterministic and reliable quality of service for each and every virtual machine in the environment, and I'll show you how you do that. So just as an example, if you're presenting storage from a traditional array up to, let's say, a uh, virtual machine hosting a SQL instance, that SQL environment will have three components. Typically, it'll have a log, uh, an index, and obviously the data volume itself. Each of those different components have uh, you know, very different performance requirements. Uh, the use of RAID here, you can see, listed against the traditional example at the top of the screen, showing you RAID 5 or 6 with a small stripe for the logs. Uh, and then we've got RAID 10 there for the index. So the index is the first part of the, the, the solution that gets hit when you, when you do a lookup on the database. Obviously, it has to be very fast. Uh, otherwise, the performance of the application can suffer. So it tends to be configured as RAID 10, uh, which uses a lot of capacity because you have the parity uh, striping across uh, multiple spindles to give you the performance that you need. Uh, and then obviously the data itself, which has a wide stripe, but can again be by RAID 5 or, or RAID 6. So but the, the key point is that they have discrete and unique performance requirements. So they have to be treated independently. And each one of those components will be delivered from different parts of the storage subsystem. So there will be different LUNs on different RAID groups configured and presented out to host those various different components. And it becomes quite complex, even in quite small environments, to do this and to keep sense of it within the storage environment. So uh, logs, indexes, and data will typically exist in different tiers of storage within your, within your environment. So it's very different. We have one logical NFS volume, which is presented up to vCenter. All components, all virtual machines, all virtual disks, and all data reside in the same NFS mount. So we don't have the concept of manually carving out the system to present different 
engineered the performance of these components. We serve them out of one logical volume, uh, and the technology itself is what's responsible for making sure that we give quality of service on a per VM and per VDIS basis. And then, um, <coughs> excuse me, one thing that we're very proud of at Sintry is the fact that we consider ourselves to be VM aware storage VAS, if you like. So we've had SAN, we've had NAS. Uh, and we like to think of ourselves as VAS, VM aware storage. We are intimately aware uh, of the hypervisor and of the virtual machines and virtual disks running in the virtual environment. And it's that awareness that gives us the ability to make dynamic decisions about performance resource allocation and how we service the requirement of each of the VMs that sit in the data store. So before I expand on that, um, I just want to show you the hardware. So it's always useful to get a look at, at what the platform looks like. We're a 3U high purpose-built appliance to leverage flash technology. So we have SSDs in this device, but we're a hybrid. We also have SATA disks. Uh, we're dual controller, fully resilient. Uh, everything's cost swappable, as you might imagine. Um, we use 10 gig. Uh, we also have a backward compatibility with 1 gig, if, if those, for those of you that, that haven't embraced 10 gig in the core yet. We have battery backs and mirrored NV RAM between the controllers, so we can't use data in flight. We have to have a power outage. Uh, it's everything you'd expect from an enterprise storage appliance. It's designed to be stacked in large environments. Um, you, can, you can stack these together and cluster them using storage DRS within VMware, if you like, to, to wrap robbing connections across the data stores. Um, but as you can see, it's, uh, it's fairly uninspiring to look at. I think it could do with some blue flashing lights on the front, personally, but um, it's actually a, a, a commodity platform. It's, it's designed made using Intel CPUs. We use Intel version 3 SSD drives. We use Hitachi starter disks. Um, there's nothing proprietary in our platform. Uh, really, the software and the file system is where we have our, our IP. This is how it mounts up to your network. We have the red network there would, would be the fabric, the storage fabric for the traffic between the ESS host machines. And then obviously we have a, a blue fabric there which is mounted up to vCenter so that we've got a separate management LAN when we share a lot of information with vCenter, uh, taking use of the, um, the extra space afforded to us in the header for metadata using NFS, which is one of the benefits of using NFS for, for virtual machines is it gives you the ability to share and use more metadata than you would otherwise with, uh, with block level protocols. So we can buy solid state disks for our EMC or for our NetApp uh, today. Um, that's a common question. You know, why, why would I invest in technology like Tintry when I can buy PAM cards for my NetApp array or I can buy you know, SSD drives for my, for my Dell or for my EMC storage or for my HP3 part? Uh, and this is the answer, okay? So traditional storage without flash, without SSDs, will give you around 28 milliseconds of round trip latency within the platform. Uh, that's allowing for SCSI reservations and queuing um, and is an average figure. Um, you'd be doing very well if you got a better response than 28 milliseconds out of most storage platforms. If you go down the other end of the scale, we've got a flash-only technology. As I mentioned before, we are a hybrid, so we're not a pure flash play. Uh, there are platforms out in the market, contemporary to Sintry, new technologies. Um, this market segment, the flash storage market segment, is becoming rapidly overcrowded. Uh, there are a number of platforms available where they are pure flash. They tend to be very, very expensive. Um, and uh, one of our key features is that we give you flash performance at more or less disk money. Um, but I'll explain how we do that. So, Traditional storage, if you buy solid state disk and you bolt it into your, to your EMC or you buy a PAM card performance module for your, for your NetApp, what you have is Flash as a cache. Uh, and Flash as a cache is very, very useful, um, certainly for, for any read intensive workload. Uh, what happens is that the data is written to disk and then over time those hot blocks of data get promoted into the cache and they can be serviced from, from the Flash uh, very, very quickly you'll get a between 10 and 15 milliseconds of round trip latency for anything served out of flash to the cache. Uh, and, and you'll get about between 30 and 50% hit rate if you're lucky. So uh, for anything read intensive, that's a very, very good solution. Um, but obviously, you know, more and more data these days has a, a dependency for low latency writes. Things, and particularly VDI springs to mind. Uh, where the working state of VDI whilst the initial download and the boot storm is very read intensive, 
everything else about VDI is right and sensitive down to moving the cursor across the screen on the desktop. So you really do need low latency write performance into, into Flash. Uh, and we take 100% of our write uh, into Flash. So we're a Flash first write architecture. So whilst we do have starter within the device, we have a very low IOP budget in our starter partition. And really it's there only to, to serve as cold data storage, cold block storage. It's not part of the production uh, tier of, 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 of capacity in a Tintry environment. If you are 100% flash, you'll get about 0.5 of a millisecond retra, uh, return uh, round trip latency uh, response. Uh, with Tintry, we get 0.6, around about 0.6 milliseconds. So we're 0.1 of a millisecond slower than some of the pure flash technologies out there. Uh, but as you'll, as you'll see towards the end of the presentation, we, we overlay uh, this feature with, with an awful lot of intelligence relevant to virtual machines. So flash as a cache is very useful. Uh, pure flash is great if you can afford it. Uh, but actually, um, what we have with our hybrid approach, we believe is, um, is much more cost effective, but also much more intelligent. And much of that intelligence really comes from the fact that we are exclusively designed for virtual machines. We do not support physical connectivity. You can't use this as a NAS. You can't mount this as a NAS in a, an NFS uh, environment. We only present as a data store to a hypervisor. Uh, because we are only a hypervisor platform, we can bring an awful lot of feature functionality to bear that the other vendors out there simply can't. They have to be everything to everybody. They have to be general purpose and in many cases multi-protocol storage platforms serving iSCSI and Fiber and SIS and FCOE. Uh, and, and we don't have that problem. So we can be very specific about addressing the niche that we have in this marketplace, which is virtual machine storage. So the file system is designed from the ground up for those virtual machines. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So our hardware is, is intelligent. It's very clever. We do things like dedupe and compression in line with the flash to make that flash partition look and feel much larger than it is. Uh, so we're getting efficiencies from flash that other, other vendors don't. Um, so whilst there's actually 2.4 terabytes of flash in this appliance, it will make it look and feel like 13 and a half terabytes usable. Um, the, the SARPA disk there, again, as I mentioned before, really just use for cold block storage. Um, we do things in line with the data uh, that, that enable us to remove configuration like RAID, partitioning within the storage from admin. We do it all dynamically. So you see we have this concept of an active working set at the top. Um, as the data comes in, we're continually profiling the data. So when reads and writes happen within Tintree, each and every read, each and every write is profiled, is run through our, uh, our IO profiling and our active working set analyzer. So we're baselining the performance and the normal behavior of every virtual machine and every read it. Uh, within the data store. Uh, we know where each 8K block of data comes from, which virtual machine and which VDisk. Uh, we also are able to recognize different patterns of traffic, different profiles of traffic. So we can determine whether an application is uh, transactionally intensive, uh, such as a SQL uh, database, or we can, uh, we can determine and distinguish between throughput intensive and latency sensitive data as well. So we're able to make very intelligent decisions on a per VM and per VDisk basis as to exactly how the service resorts uh, to the virtual machine environment. And so you see we have these arrows underneath where it says active working set. Uh, and above IO profiling, you see we have these vertical arrows. These represent logical lanes. The analogy that I've used here is, is one of VLANs, very similar to the VLAN concept of being able to isolate and provide deterministic performance uh, and, and a, a channel for traffic, uh, which can be mapped to individual virtual machines and VDISCs. So each VM and VDIS can have its own clear channel of communication. So we do not allow you know, a noisy neighbor scenario to develop. So you can't have within Tintree the concept of having you know, a, a throughput intensive uh, file server starve out a latency sensitive VDI client, for example, just does not exist. That, that's not possible within a Tintree environment. You know, we're able to isolate those VMs. And we do it without you having to tell us. So we learn your environment when you mount it into vCenter and you start migrating virtual machines into the data store, we, we begin learning the moment that they hit the data store. Uh, we profile those, those virtual machines and we'll, we'll provide deterministic performance and dynamic quality of service on a per VM and per 
uh, be dissipated to those machines. So before the data is written to the solid state disk here, you can see that it runs through an inline dedupe and compression engine. That inline dedupe and compression is designed purely to maximize the efficiency of the solid state disk resource in your time. It doesn't mean that we give you a 13 and a half terabyte usable data store and you can store 25, 30, 40 terabytes of data in it. Uh, it is thinly provisioned, so you can oversubscribe the box uh, using thin provisioning, but we're not deduping the data on the back end. So for every block of data that's written in Sintry, we reserve a block of data in the starter for that, for that machine. Uh, so it really is a 13 and a half terabyte usable footprint. Uh, it's very much more efficient than, than VMFS formatted LUN based architectures because we can make much better utilization of the volume. So 13 and a half terabytes of Sintry is vastly more usable uh, than, uh, than 13 and a half terabytes of LUNs provisioned from any other traditional storage vendor. So um, I can expand on that in more detail with, with any of you if you'd like to, uh, an exact way that we, we use striping across the, uh, across the drives. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me about it afterwards, I'm not sure you'll get my contact details and you're able to get in touch. Um, some of, the some, of, some of the issues around uh, quality with, with solid state disks in the past uh, no longer exist. I won't say that there isn't still concern in the marketplace, um, but certainly they're, they're, they're very reliable now. So we use enterprise MRC flash disks from Intel, they're the version 3 disks. And we do certain things with our flash disks uh, to treat them in such a way that we get uh, a five-year life cycle. So part of the issue with, with the early um, concerns over flash reliability was due to the profile of use uh, within most storage appliances. So you can't just mount solid state disks in a storage array and treat them like spinning disks. Um, they will wear out very quickly. Uh, you will have write amplification issues where performance drops off a cliff um, after a very short period of time. Uh, and so they don't like to be ran written to randomly. They don't like a random scattering of blocks across the file system solid state disk. Uh, so we do we do a number of things. Firstly, we're buffering all of the incoming writes into our NVRAM and our DRAM. Uh, we build a wide stripe of write, and then we write across the SSD partition with a full stripe uh, in a sequential manner, which is which is how the SSDs like to be written to. Uh, so we use a, a full cell and we move on to the next cell so on and so on until we get all the way to the end of the file system and then we'll come back and we'll start again. And, and that gives us a very smooth and consistent performance curve. We'll give you 75,000 IOPS out of this 3U high appliance, uh, which, is, which is the same level of performance that you'd get from 800 fiber channel drives in a single RAID group if you were able to build such a thing. Uh, so very, very fast, um, but also we get that five-year life expectancy we're dramatically reducing the number of writes that occur within that uh, SSD tier. So by wide striping and buffering the writes and destaging them uh, in, a, in a wide stripe, we're able to get a much better longevity out of the disk. And obviously I've already talked about the, the relative benefits um, economically through using inline dedupe and compression. So we make this 2.5, 2.4 terabyte uh, SSD partition look and feel and behave like 13.5 terabytes of usable and if you were to go to any one of the pure flash vendors out there or even to uh, any of the traditional vendors and ask for 13 and a half terabytes of flash, uh, you'd, you'd pay seven figures for it in some cases. So it's uh, very, very expensive indeed. So, so we're able to, do, able to give you this flash performance that's uh, more or less this pricing. So before I show you the, the, the file system and the, and the user interface, which is where you, you know, it will start to become clear to what our goal in life is as a, as a company. I want to just take you through this summary. The Tintry overcomes complexity. Many, many uh, data stores in traditional environments can be reduced uh, to fewer, larger NFS presented volumes, uh, which dramatically reduces the complexity in most people's environments. We have the ability to host huge densities of virtual machines through that intelligent awareness of the virtual machine environment. Uh, being able to provision quality of service on a per VM and isolate the virtual machines in the environment means that we can have many, many more virtual machines residing in the same data store. Uh, 
Uh, another key benefit of NSS actually here is that if you have a LUN um, presented to a uh, virtual host uh, and you're running, let's say best practices is around 10 to 12 virtual servers within that one LUN formatted with VMFS, LUNs lock uh, at the LUN level. So every time a VM wants to access data within the storage, it locks the LUN, uh, accesses the data, it makes its read or write request, and then, and then will release the LUN. The same way that, that file locking works within, a, within a, a file server environment, only at the LUN level. So that's actually the reason why VMware don't recommend huge LUNs, and they don't recommend you know, more than 10, 12, 15 virtual servers within any one uh, volume, within any, within any one uh, VMFS volume. Um, so NFS doesn't have this issue. NFS is a file-based protocol. Virtual machines within an NFS environment look like files, and all of the VMDKs, all of the virtual disks, uh, can be locked independently of each other. So when a machine is locked, it doesn't impact its neighbors. So through a combination of that function and also our intelligent file system, we're able to host massive densities of virtual machines, and it's not uncommon to have in excess of a thousand virtual machines running on, in one three U high tin tree data store. Simplified deployment and ongoing management and simplified troubleshooting, that's something I'm going to physically show you, so I won't dwell on that. The performance obviously is very fast. We have flash based appliance, we have massive flash resources available to you. So if we were enabling you to write straight through to those flash drives without buffering it, without being queued about how we stripe it across the SSD, there'd actually be hundreds of thousands of IOPS available to you. Uh, we give you 75,000 IOPS consistently, which will sustain 24-7. Um, so it is very fast, and that's read and write uh, performance. The inline DJ compression makes that flash much more cost effective. The intelligent working set analysis and the IO profiling that we do means that we can make very intelligent decisions about which data we serve from flash and which we evict as cold data to starter. And it's very, very effective for I.O. intensive applications, so for databases and BDI particularly. <coughs> Excuse me. And the cost here, we're talking about cost per gigabyte is the typical metric used by storage vendors to, to position their products. Uh, really that's not a very valid um, yeah, metric to use uh, in a flash environment, certainly not very attractive when you look at it cost per gigabyte, uh, even with dehuman compression, but certainly if you look at it cost per I.O., cost per managed virtual machine, uh, then Tintry starts to become a very, very attractive proposition. So I just want to look at a, a case study uh, very briefly. It's just one slide. Uh, Tipco, a financial uh, organization, they make uh, financial software. Uh, they deployed Tintry for a terabyte Oracle financial database. This was done to reduce the footprint and the cost, the capital cost of the hardware that was running their production environment. So they, they deployed us initially into DR, into their DR site. They didn't want to buy a big Oracle rack uh, to run a, a mirror of their uh, production systems uh, in disaster recovery in the, in the secondary site. Uh, so they decided to try virtualizing Oracle, which is something that not very many people do. Uh, it's very difficult to give performance to a, to a virtual instance of Oracle without compromising the storage layer anyway. Uh, so it's, uh, it's often uh, given up as a, as a bad job. But um, we were able to deploy Tintree in behind uh, a number of uh, standard um, you know, uh, compute servers uh, at a third the cost of the primary storage. And we actually delivered 200% performance increase at, over the production system uh, with a dramatic reduction in cost and footprint. Um, obviously, we delivered that entire terabyte database out of flash in 177 gigabytes of capacity after we deduped and compressed it. Uh, and they were so impressed that they put their business forecasting tool from SAP uh, on the same platform and we did exactly the same. So just really to highlight the fact that you know, we are designed to make these challenging applications easy to virtualize uh, and perform very, very well. And not only are they easy to virtualize and not only do they perform well, but we're able to show you exactly how they're performing because we report on every virtual machine and every VDISC in the, in the data store. VDI is an interesting um, challenge, actually. As I mentioned before, apart from the bootstorm uh, and antivirus, which can be very read-intensive, um, everything else about VDI is write-intensive. So instead of an 80-20 read-to-write uh, 
ratio typically is 20, 20 80 or even even 10 90 uh, in some cases and so the user experience the desktop experience uh, is very much latency sensitive uh, so even moving your cursor across the screen can become laborious uh, and uninteresting very quickly if the storage doesn't give you enough performance and, and to get enough right performance for anything more than you know a very small number of VDI desktops you need a lot of disk lots and lots of this. So anybody with more than 50 users is going to be spending significant amounts of money on, on storage. Um, and, and there's a RAID write penalty. So if you're using RAID 5, you know, there's a five times or four times um, you know, parity penalty paid on, on, on the write. So you know, it means that the performance available to you slashed uh, the write I.O. performance budget that you have within your storage uh, can fall way short of the requirements. So sizing, configuring, storage, to go back to that slide at the, at the start of the presentation, which was EMC's reference for a 500 seat model, uh, you know, you need lots of spindles. Uh, preferably you need some flash in there as well. Um, but it's, it's very expensive and often VDI projects fail before they get going due to the perceived cost of the storage uh, alone. So uh, something that Tintry are able to address, uh, we're, we're specifically designed for virtual machine environments and and on top of that, we're designed to leverage Flash. So we're able to give you this huge right IOPS budget within our clients to make uh, VDI work very well. So just to give you an idea, obviously we are fairly new to market. However, we're not uh, we're not squeaky clean or brand new. We are um, now in our second year of shipping product. Uh, 200 customers globally, as I mentioned. Some very well-known names in here. Uh, we've got banks, we've got legal, we've got finance, we've got uh, education, uh, we've got server and VDI, we've got server and VDI on the same platforms in many cases, which is something that you're able to do with Tintry that you can't do with other technologies, or it's certainly not advised uh, that you mix server and VDI environments together. That's something we're able to deliver. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you'll recognize lots of the names on here, but um, if there's any case studies that you'd like to see or you'd like to have a discussion about a particular vertical application or a particular use case, then you know, feel free to get in touch with Ian or the Air 47, and, uh, and we can we can open that discussion with you. So what I want to do now is that you know, it's going to take about another 10 minutes, is just to walk you through some of the screens within the user interface. Uh, so bear with me whilst I uh, switch to my uh, browser. Okay, right, so this is the dashboard, this is the screen that you're displayed. Regardless of how you choose to access the machine, whether you go in through vCenter using a viewer, uh, or whether you use a web browser and you, you, you hit the IP address or the URL for the appliance, you're presented with the same screen. This is the main dashboard. Uh, really, it's designed to give you a snapshot of how the environment's running. So you can see here along the top, uh, we've got the current I.O. Uh, on the device, it's an aggregate figure, it's a 10 minute average. And then you can see here underneath that, uh, we've got the, uh, the range of high and low over the last seven days. Uh, and then obviously through the latency uh, and the amount of data being served off of this appliance in the flash. And we aim to serve 99% of all reads and writes from flash. Uh, and so it's very rare to see this drop below 100, 99%. Um, you can see these two fuel gauges, they're very um, typical within a, a storage environment. You'll get a space gauge, you'll get some form of indicator as to how much capacity is left within your environment once you've carved it out. Uh, we're no different, we provide you with this uh, capacity fuel gauge, but also because of the I.O. profiling that we do uh, and the baselining that we do in the Active Working Set Analyzer, um, we're able to tell you how much performance you have left within your appliance. And so it's very common in storage to be able to say, I have capacity, uh, but it's very hard uh, to, to know exactly how much performance you have left. And so what tends to happen is that more virtual machines will be deployed within a data store, uh, and, and all of a sudden you'll reach the I.O. threshold of the appliance, the storage becomes a bottleneck, and it affects everybody, all of the virtual machines within the environment. So uh, it can be a challenge. Uh, and, and, and customers that I've worked with tend to over-provision spindles, over-provision performance and capacity in order to give them the I.O. budget that they need to, to provide that deterministic level of performance to our 
applications that they're rolling out. Um, so we're able to give you the insight that you do have capacity, you do have free performance resource, you can add more machines into the data store. Over on the right hand side here we have uh, performance reserves changes and space changes. And these are the virtual machine names assigned to the VMs within vCenter. So the VM admin or the server admin will have given these machines these names. They're not abstracted in any way. They're not iSCSI uh, target IDs. They're not worldwide names. They're not, they're not storage uh, uh, abstractions. They're not using storage terminology. They are the actual server names that you would have given the machines. So it's very easy to see at a glance what's happening with the server admin or for the VM admin that might not be uh, necessarily intimate with storage to, uh, traditionally within your, your, your organization. So um, this will show performance change up or down as a percentage, and it's the top 10 performance reserves changes. So you can see very quickly if there's something unusual happening, if there's been a, a, a change to the baseline performance of a particular uh, server or virtual machine within the environment, you'll see it in this, uh, in this top 10 here. And then underneath that is exactly the same, but it's just a capacity consumption resource uh, graph. You can click on any one of these and it will dive into the virtual machine itself and show you the performance metrics. Uh, in order to do that, um, to give you the best view of the platform, I think the, the best way for me to do that is just to click on uh, find a VM. Before I do that, I want to show you that you can click on any of these headings here uh, and, get a, and get a graph. So if I click on, on the IO, on the performance, you can see that this is the aggregate performance of the appliance. And if I hover over these peaks, you can see the read to write ratio. You can see the I/O ratio for the read to write, and you can see on the on the right hand side, on the far right hand side, you can see the top contributors to this performance metric. So you can see at a glance what the box is doing, uh, what the I/O workload's like, and actually who's contributing to that workload in terms of the server estate. If you double click on these graphs, in fact, if you double click on any graph of inventory, it'll take you back uh, seven days. Uh, so as well as providing real-time statistics, we can show you seven days of history uh, against each and every virtual machine in the environment. Uh, so this makes troubleshooting uh, performance issues within your application layer uh, a lot easier than it currently is. I mean, this information is available to you uh, if you use third-party tools, you know, SolarWinds, Network Sniffers, NetFlow Analysis, uh, technologies like that. So obviously some storage appliances are able to give you a LUN-level view of performance. Uh, but like I said, if you're, put, if you're putting 10, 12, or 15 virtual machines in every single LUN that you have, uh, then whilst you can see what a particular LUN is doing, you're unable at the storage layer to see any further down in the stack than that. You can't, you can't tell anybody what a particular virtual machine is doing at the storage LUN level. Uh, so we're able to make that distinction and show you that data. And, and again, if you hover over these points, you can, you can see exactly what the read to write ratio is like. I could show you throughput. I can show you uh, the latency, um, which is often, um, those are the three most commonly used metrics for performance troubleshooting, I.O., throughput, and, and latency. But we can also show you know, performance reserves allocation. We can show the flash resource utilization and capacity utilization on a per VM basis, or as this graph is doing overall as, as an aggregate for the data store. If I click on the Find a VM tab up here in the main menu, we'll have a list of all the virtual machines that are sitting in the data store right now. This could be a very large list, as I mentioned. If we, if we were doing VDI here, it would be and could commonly be you know, hundreds, if not, if not a thousand or more uh, virtual machines here. Um, you can order them by clicking on the filters at the top here. Uh, these filters are the, the ones that are displayed by default. If you right-click on this uh, option at the top here, there are actually some 60 or 70 different metrics that we track per virtual machine that you can include to report on in this list. So you can change and, and customize this view. If I click on I.O., I'll order them uh, in, in order of performance resource demand, and we can see what the, uh, the top performing virtual machines are in the environment. And you, you can see here that, again, we're tracking I.O. through for reserves, latency, flash, provision versus use size, so that you can see that in some cases there's some pretty significant thin provisioning going on here. You can also see the host, the physical host that they're sitting on. And obviously, if there are any snapshots, you'll be able to see that the last snapshot was taken uh, according to the time date stamp on the right-hand side here. Um, we can go one further than this view, and we can drill into any one of these virtual machines. So if I click on this one here, uh, we get the IO 
profile of this particular virtual machine. Again, I can double click on this graph and go back seven days. But one thing that's interesting is you have to be troubleshooting or uh, trying to find a performance bottleneck in the environment. Let's say you had a, you know, a performance issue at 3 o'clock yesterday with your exchange environment. You can double click on the graph uh, to go back in time. You can look back over seven days, but you can also split the screen. So if I click here, I can actually show two graphs. I can correlate the I.O. versus the throughput, uh, or I can correlate throughput versus latency versus flash tip ratio. Uh, I can even look at the host machine itself. So this is a bad example. This is a very well-performing virtual machine. So I'm going to take you back to the, to the menu. Um, let's wait for the screen to refresh here. Close these graphs. Reorder my display. If I was to show you this one here, this is a this is a machine which has been designed to show high host latency. So if I click on the latency tab, you'll see that the the, the bar the, the graphs are color coded, uh, and this is where it starts to get really interesting. So the latency tab is one that we're very proud of at Century. So we're able to show you latency within the host, which is the green. You see, there's a lot of green on this on this particular virtual machine because there's a lot of host latency. We'll also show you latency induced by the network, uh, the storage, both at the front end, so our file system, our dedupe engine, the I.O. profiling, which is the, the blue section here. And then you can see that disk is, is, is showing it's zero milliseconds here because we're not actually pulling any data from the back end start the disk at all. So the blue includes the file system and, and the solid state partition. And then the, the orange, which you can't see because there isn't any on this graph, is actually data being pulled from, from SASIS. So but at a glance, if you hover over any of these peaks, you can see for any given uh, transactional peak, we can show you what the latency profile looks like. And you can see that with this machine here, we have some very high host latency. So if we click on the host tab, you can see that we actually report on the percentage uh, CPU usage, but also the percentage swap rate and the percentage ready. Uh, and so this uh, would indicate that um, potentially that there, there needs to be more, more, more RAM added to this particular virtual machine. Also, in some cases, if you see a, a, a particularly high percentage ready field here, it could indicate that there are maybe too many virtual CPUs or virtual cores assigned to the, to the particular VM, uh, and the machine is waiting to have access to all of the cores before it can bring them to bear on the virtual machine performance. So it never, never pays to add too many virtual cores to your, to your virtual machine. But we're able to give you an insight. We're able to give you back the visibility that, that traditionally you lose when you virtualize servers and applications on traditional storage. So traditional storage was designed 15 years, 20 years before uh, virtualization hit the market. And it's really not designed to be able to give you the granular view uh, of your virtual machine estate that you need today in today's data. Uh, and that's what we're purpose built for. So you can see that instead of demanding your time and demanding that you configure uh, the storage, uh, it's very much a case of, of it's almost plug and play. It's not plug and play. It, you know, you do need to configure it. But if I show you the configuration screen uh, by going to the settings tab here, uh, I'm not going to change it. But you can see that we can uh, give it an IP address. We can give it a NetMaster gateway, the VLAN IDs. We need to give it passwords. Uh, so that it can, it has read-write access into vCenter. Uh, we do support VAAI and VADP, and, and so you are able to offload uh, certain tasks from within vCenter to to Tintry. So, for example, snapshotting and cloning; uh, those are functions that you can drive from within the hypervisor at vCenter, uh, but offload the performance to uh, to the storage. So we do support that, and, and obviously we are able to write back things like snapshots and clones that are taken on Tintree and push them back up into the vCenter inventory. So we have a, a two-way read-write environment running uh, with vCenter. Everything that we do within the Tintree environment is at the per VM or per vDisk basis. So if you want to take a snapshot, you can right-click on the machine and take a snapshot. Uh, the snapshotting is uh, redirect on write uh, similar to NetApps in that respect, and it doesn't take up a lot of space. We're just taking an image of the metadata and the pointers for the data, 
uh, we're able to take um, a, a very large number of, of snapshots on this appliance per virtual machine. Uh, and we keep a vaulted history of snapshots so that you can clone from any one of those snapshots uh, and present a virtual machine uh, to a particular point in time for, for test and dev or for backup or rollback or recovery as required. Uh, our snapshotting uh, and, and the cloning, as I said, is per virtual machine. So unlike traditional storage where if you want to take a snapshot on your storage appliance uh, of a particular virtual machine, you have to snapshot an entire lung or an entire volume uh, capturing with it, you know, any uh, any other number of virtual machines that might sit in the same uh, volume. With Tintree, you can be very specific about what you snapshot and what you clone at any time. Uh, so very very granular. Uh, it enables you to make snapshots and, and, and recovery a uh, very quick process. Um, and obviously, given that we use flash technology, we actually have a very very fast cloning feature. So you're able to take 500 clones uh, in in as little as a minute. Here with Tintree, and then anybody that's, that's tried to run cloning in a VM environment, particularly for virtual desktop, uh, for, 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 for large deployments, will know that it takes you know, upwards of a minute to clone one virtual machine, typically. So we can do the work of uh, uh, traditional storage uh, 500 times quicker, essentially, by making 500 clones available to you in, in as little as a minute. And we will push those clones back up into vCenter's inventory, and they'll sit there as powered off the end. Um, and they won't take up any space on the storage at all until you start to power them on and the, the, the data starts to diverge from the original image and then we take change blocks uh, into the storage as uh, incremental growth. So uh, it's a very, very space efficient cloning feature. Uh, initially they take up no extra space. We de and compress the clones. Uh, so if you build your golden image for a VDI environment, for example, on Tintree, and then you roll those clones out, roll your environment out by cloning that image out, it's very space efficient. So we ran with VMware uh, very recently um, in their labs run by them uh, a benchmarking test and exercise using VMView, uh, some Dell servers uh, and one of our Tintree appliances. Uh, and they managed to run a thousand linked clones consecutively uh, uh, at the same time concurrently uh, rather with, um, with only 0.5 of a terabyte of used capacity. Uh, they did that within two and a half hours from start to finish, including racking all of the equipment and powering it all on. Uh, and we were able to give an ultrabook level performance to every single one of those virtual machines running in that environment. Uh, and from 3U high uh, of storage, uh, that's a serious, um, a serious ability. So we're, we're very proud of that, uh, of that trial. Uh, we have some documentation which, uh, which talks about it in more detail, and I can share that with you after the session if you're interested. Um, do ask Ian for a, for a copy. Uh, it makes very interesting reading. So uh, VDI is a particular strength of ours. But whether it's a server virtual, uh, a virtual server environment or a, v, a virtual desktop environment, or whether in fact you want to run both concurrently on the same environment, uh, the same appliance rather, uh, we're, we're very much capable of doing that. So, so that reaches really the end of the presentation. Uh, I am able to take any questions that we have at this point. Ian, have we got any questions at all? Um. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so, in terms of uh, time remaining, if you've got any uh, questions, if you can just put, the, put them in the questions tab. Um, the other thing I just wanted to add was that um, this is technology that you really have to uh, see it in action. So, we're very open to um, evaluations, and if you wanted to get in touch about that, then um, Please do that. Uh, so a couple of the questions that, that, that we have had are around the support. Uh, obviously, being a design, a technology designed for the enterprise uh, and for the mid-market space uh, in large clustered environments, we do have a four-hour response. Uh, it is 24/7. It cost us a lot of money, actually, um, as a startup to bring that to market a couple of years ago. Uh, but we recognise the fact that our target market needed nothing less. So. Uh, we have a four-hour and a next business day SLA, both of which are 24-7, follow the sun, um, support packages serviced by Glasshouse and Choice Logistics, which is who does all the VMCs and Cisco support. Uh, so it's very, very good. We have a call home feature on the appliance, so it's monitored. Uh, we get a lightweight bundle sent to us every, every evening, giving us the state of the, the hardware appliance itself. Um, so we will see if you have a better drive, or if you have any outages at all, we, we will see typically before you will, and we can, we can kick off the SLA and respond accordingly. Um, 
another question uh, that we've had is about uh, about replication support for replication. Uh, we currently are in beta uh, with our replication code, so snapshots and cloning are available today at no extra cost. Uh, replication uh, is a feature that's going to be added towards the end of Q1, uh, so uh, March sort of time frame uh, in 2013. Uh, but it will be very, very different to traditional storage replication. So what we'll be able to do is snapshot, clone, and then replicate machines from tin tree to tin tree uh, very, very efficiently and very quickly uh, at a granular level. So again, it's going to be per virtual machine level, so you'll be able to highlight exactly the VM that you want to replicate uh, and move just that VM from primary to secondary, um, which means that if you've got environments such as SharePoint, uh, you'll be able to create consistency groups, so you can have you know, the, the web server components, the SQL components, the file server components uh, as a consistency group and replicate them on the same policy at the same time. Uh, we're able to make them uh, application consistent with the snapshotting engine that we have, um, integrated to, to VMware, uh, so we will quiesce uh, the, the, the application and, and using um, VSS under Windows will we'll quiesce the application through, through that mechanism. Well, so it's, it's uh, they're intelligent uh, uh, application consistent snapshots. Uh, so you'll be able to replicate a consistent image of your SharePoint portal as a whole from, from point A to point B uh, without having to drag a lot of unnecessary virtual machines and volumes across with it um, purely through the, uh, through the, the rather heavy handed uh, mechanism for snapshots that other, other storage vendors have. So again, it's really a per VM view of the world that we're offering. Okay, I've, I've just got one, just one question coming through, Gavin. They're just asking about the um, the VM World um, award that was given. Right? Yes, so um, we're very proud of that. Obviously, it was the second award that we've won uh, in consecutive years. So um, we were awarded with uh, the Gold Award in the Best Hardware for Virtualization category at uh, VM World. That's actually the, that's the top award. It's the top spot. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an award we're very proud of. So, uh, so best hardware platform for virtualization, uh, obviously given the pedigree of the company and the, the, the history of the, the senior management team and the engineering team, most of them came from VMware. Um, that actually, contrary to popular belief, makes it even harder to win an award at VMworld. Uh, we have to pedal twice as fast as everyone else uh, so that people don't think we're being biased. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a very... It's a very um, the ringing accolade for okay. our technology center. All right, thanks, Matt. Gavin. Well, our, um, our time's up. I hope you've uh, in, enjoyed the session. And I just personally wanted to say thanks for Gavin's time. Um, as I say, if, you, if you've got any other follow-up questions, uh, my email uh, on the screen at the moment. And um, between me and Gavin, we'll, we'll um, field those for you. And uh, thanks for your time. If, uh, if anybody would like a quote, or would like more information, uh, particularly a quote, obviously, um, please do get in touch uh, with Ian at Layer 47 and, and we can put that, uh, put that across to you on a one-to-one -one basis. But thanks for your time today. I've enjoyed it. All right. Thanks again. Bye-bye.